Good evening and welcome to tonight's webinar with Sir Julian Brazier. I have known Sir Julian for a number of years and can assure you that he is a staunch monarchist and a firm supporter of our Westminster system of governance. And for many years has been agitating for Britain to leave the European Union and regain its own sovereignty. He was in the British House of Commons for around 30 years, representing the electorate of Canterbury. After serving in a number of positions on the opposition front bench and in the parliament, he became parliamentary under Secretary of State for Reserves in 2014, until he left the Parliament at the 2016 election. His appointment as Minister for the Reserves was most appropriate as he had joined the Territorial Army at the age of 19 and served for 13 years, five of which were with the SAS Reserve. It is therefore a tremendous delight to welcome Sir Julian Brazier. There will be a period of questions following his comments. Welcome, Sir Julian. Thank you very much for that introduction. It's uh, a great honor to have this opportunity to address the Australian Monarchist League um, and particularly to see my dear friend uh, Philip and indeed Santo Santoro who I understand is joining us. I'm very conscious of the fact it's the cocktail hour in Australia now uh, but presumably as most people are zooming from home I'm not coming between anyone and their evening drink. At 94 the monarch we're privileged to share is still on remarkable form. But before saying something about the monarchy and the many other things we share, forgive me if I spend a little time on the dark side. And there's a great deal of dark stuff in the world at the moment. From opposite ends of the world, Britain and Australia share some challenges, some would say daunting challenges. You took a terrible pasting earlier in the year from those fires I must say our hearts went out to you from Britain and I felt very proud that several hundred of our firefighters came out to help. Next of course came Covid where you've done a much better job than we have so far and full marks to your government for identifying that laboratory, the extent to which Wuhan um, labor scientific laboratory was responsible and for calling for an international inquiry. We're with you in standing up to the Chinese. Then, of course, we've still got North Korea branching its nuclear weapons closer to us. We've got Russia still um, organized crime all over Europe and tanks in Ukraine. The Allied withdrawal from Afghanistan, where I have a son serving, multiple instability in the Middle East, all challenges for the West. Just humor me for a moment longer. At the same time, the global economy is barely crawling towards a fragile recovery, while America its motor economy is so desperately divided and COVID deaths are continuing to rise there. The EU is split down the middle with Southern Europe calling for a bailout from the richer Northern countries which have done so well out of the single currency. And finally, the culture wars are splitting communities all over the world. The latest turn of the handle, the genuine outrage at that horrendous police incident in America has been hijacked in so many places into becoming uh, increasingly violent demonstrations. In fact, pulling it all together, um, a look at the media is almost enough to put one off one's evening drink. So where's the hope in all of this? Well, in dangerous times, one should start from the principle of who are one's best mates, who can one rely on? And Britain and Australia 
share so much. Your great country and mine share the Queen, who's made three major addresses, as you know, in the last year or so. And her speech on COVID was, for so many, a shot in the arm, a message of hope and solidarity. She, who had seen so much in her life, when she said, we'll meet again, it echoed round the world. And of course, today we've just lost Dame Vera Lynn, who sang that remarkable song. That speech came between her addresses on D-Day and VE Day. Once again, she rose above politics, reminding us what we have to be proud about and the values we share and the monarch we share. She reminded us that when Britain's back was against the wall, when continental Europe had been overrun, when the Russians were still in an alliance with Hitler and even the Americans were hedging their bets, Britain didn't stand alone. People came from all over the countries that are now the Commonwealth, including so many young Australians, as they had in the previous World War, when people like my great uncle and his gallant comrades in the Australian Light Horse were fighting in Palestine and so many other fronts. And blood and shared values epitomized by the Crown won through in both wars, of course. And the Queen served in uniform, as you all know. Prince Philip was on destroyers. More recently, Prince Charles served as a Navy pilot at a time when the casualties in peacetime among the fleet air arm were higher than they had been in wartime in many parts of the armed forces. And Prince William too was a gallant RAF pilot, finishing his career with quite recently on search and rescue. And I was so pleased to hear how successful his tour of Australia with Kate and the children had been. That brings me back to today. What is the most important defence relationship our countries belong to? For us, I don't think it's NATO any longer, although that's still important, but it's becoming increasingly toothless. It's the Five Eyes arrangement. And who are the five countries of the Five Eyes intelligence arrangement? Well, it's America, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and Britain. That's America and four countries who share the Queen as the head of state. And again and again, those countries have stood shoulder to shoulder. Korea, the Balkans, East Timor, Iraq, twice, Afghanistan. Our armed forces have stood together against enemies from the Kaiser to Al-Qaeda and ISIS. And Australia, Canada, New Zealand and Britain all have the Westminster system of democracy and first past the post too, apart from the Kiwis, well, forgive them that, the common law, the English language, cricket, rugby, the list goes on and on. And our economies are intertwined too, despite the EU, which I'm gonna say something about, Britain is the second largest investor in Australia still. And the language we share is at the heart of so much of economics. It's not just these days the language of transactions, that's been the case for generations, it's so often part of the transaction itself. Television programs, Britain's love, neighbours, my mother's hooked on it. Films, songs, computer games, customer facing uh, language in most computer software is English. Legal services, accounting services, the list goes on and on. Of the, in the age of the internet, the Anglosphere is getting closer and closer and the values and institutions we share are our best hope, grounded in ties of blood, history, culture, economics, and of course the monarchy. On previous visits to Australia, as an MP, I used to say all these things and stress the, infor the informal political linkage. Any subject from support arrangements, child support arrangements, to policing, to my own particular hobby horse, reserve forces, the first place many British MPs look for comparisons is the arrangements in other countries which share the Westminster system. But behind that there was always a reservation because Britain was stuck in the EU 
an arrangement which prevented us from striking trade deals, indeed had cut us off with some of the trade with countries like Australia. That's why it's so exciting, as Philip has said, that we've thrown, that we've left the EU and we throw off the last of its legal shackles in six months time. It's exciting that at this very moment, in fact, yesterday, the process started of negotiating an ambitious new Australian-UK trade agreement. The formal negotiations yesterday, but of course the preparations have been going on for some time. Now, as a lover of Australian wine, I have to say it's Australian reds and Kiwi whites, uh, I note that you already account for a fifth of all the wine sold in the UK, despite an outrageous tariff. I look forward to that going on January the 1st. They will have failed in the trade agreement if it doesn't. But the trade deal is just the first step. I very much enjoyed your webinar with Senator Eric Abetz on Kanzuk last month. Kanzuk promotes free trade and free movement of people between the four main Elizabethan realms. And I firmly believe it's the right way forward. And I believe it'll happen having Australian, Canadian, and indeed South African relatives who fought in both world wars. I can't wait to see changes in the arrangement at Heathrow. You know, I tried to move a private members bill to uh, uh, get people from the realms into the domestic channel. It failed, of course, because the EU rules and the rest of it that it applied then. I got an email from a journalist in Canada whose father had been a Battle of Britain pilot. And this gallant old man had by chance flown to Britain for the first time for many years from Germany. And he had the humiliation of getting off a Lufthansa flight and finding everybody else going through the domestic channel while he was pushed through the foreign one. That must stop and stop very soon. I would like to just end my remarks because the most best bit of the webinar is always the discussion uh, with a story about the time the first queen visited America as a very young woman. Her father had just died and she hadn't even been crowned. The president in those days was that really very great president, Harry Truman, who welcomed her with a party in the White House. Truman was from a modest background and his mother had come up to Washington and was living in a sort of granny flat uh, in the attic of the White House. When Her Majesty and Prince Philip uh, met um, Mrs. Truman Sr., um, Mrs. Truman said to the Queen, uh, welcome to America. I'm so glad to see you got elected. Now, <laughs> it was a lovely warm welcome and a completely understandable mistake. But I think the story illustrates in a nutshell why the Americans are our dear friends but the Australians are our cousins, because no Australian, not even the most ardent Republican, I think would have made that mistake. Well, over to you for the questions. Thank you so much, Sir Julian. So um, at this stage, I'm going to invite you all to ask uh, any questions. In the uh, toolbar, uh, Dan, uh, in your Zoom application, you'll see a Q&A um, button. So if you click on that, um, there's already been some kind of great feedback in the chat panel, but uh, if you can place your questions there and that will enable us to ensure that we respond to all of them. So I'll just give you a, a minute or so to do that. It's nice to see all the comments in the panel. I hadn't realized that my uh, comment on where I was sitting had gone out to everybody. It was meant to be a message to Philip, <laughs> explaining why I'd moved in the, in the seat. I uh, reorganized the screen a bit. Uh, now, go. I see somebody's asked a question on the right hand side. Shall I answer? Shall I read? Can everybody yes, see that? Uh, with it, that they can't. Would you? Uh, I'm happy to read it out, or you can, Sir Julian, if you want. Uh, 
I'm very happy to read that. Sure. Somebody's asked, how strong is the Republican presence in the UK? And are there any lessons that we can learn from the monarchists in the motherland to apply to our campaign down under? Um, that's quite a difficult question for me to answer as a Brit. Um, the Republican presence in the UK is, uh, is very weak. Um, the, uh, uh, there's a group mostly on the left, although there are one or two eccentric right wingers who, who want to see an end to the monarchy, but they're a very small presence. But of course, because the Queen is resident in the UK, uh, they don't have, they can't reach for the same sort of arguments that Republicans in Australia are reaching for. I think um, when I, I was over there during your referendum campaign, um, by sheer, it, it was largely by chance. Um, and I wasn't, as a Brit, I, I, it would have been inappropriate for me to have directly intervene. But by being, for example, photographed underneath a picture of Queen in, in uh, a Melbourne uh, uh, reserve training centre in the local papers and this sort of thing, I, I, uh, I, I was tried to participate. Let me, let me just, uh, indirectly, let me just give you uh, two or three thoughts. Firstly, I think Britain leaving uh, the EU in Brexit is going to give a tremendous positive push uh, to the monarchist side of the argument. I think there'll be a lot of good stuff coming out of uh, Simon, Simon Birmingham at the moment is, is, is leading for you on the trade negotiations on the trade side, which will echo through business. And I think that once we can get Heathrow sorted out, uh, and if I was in Parliament, I'd be pressing really hard on that, that will also send an important message to all the Australians coming through. So I think there'll be some positive underlying traits. Once COVID's out of the way, I think it's very important that there's another royal tour, and I believe that there will be another one quite soon uh, after COVID is lifted. So what can you do for yourselves? If I was in your shoes, I would link arms uh, with um, uh, New Zealand and Canada, particularly New Zealand. Um, in both those countries, the Republican movement is much weaker for slightly different reasons. Um, but uh, your close ties to New Zealand, where of course the knighthood thing went down very well, taking back the traditional honour system and so on, went down much more successfully in Australia in, than it did in Australia. Um, at a time when you're getting closer to New Zealand, I think you want to get more New Zealand voices involved in your in your movement, perhaps. Um, one suggestion. Um, I think um, the fact you've got a monarchist there at the moment uh, should see you through until the sort of changing atmosphere I'm describing starts to, to move through. Um, and what Philip was so brilliant on last time round in the, in the last referendum campaign, keep challenging people on the alternative. You know, what is it that they're actually proposing? Because actually, Republicans, in my experience, the world over, never really agree on what they want. Um, the, uh, the Westminster system is a very different one from the American one. I love the uh, 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 Americans. I've got lots of American friends. Um, but, uh, but their system is not the Westminster system. And try to operate with a system where you have a sort of president with a Westminster system. It's quite hard to see how it's going to work. The difficulty is that the reserve powers of the head of state um, actually getting uh, uh, arranged so that they're there in the kind of constitutional crisis that you had with Gough Whitlam, but very, very, very seldom used, is not as easy as people pretend. Right. Oh, th thank um, you so much. Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, so thank you so much, Sir Julian, for that uh, very elaborate uh, answer. We have a number of other questions flowing through to the Q&A panel. I'll just um, uh, pull out one at random from Senator Erica Betts, who writes, uh, who thanks you for a great contribution and says, is there any real opposition to a FTA between UK and Australia? And the second question is, which areas will benefit each country beside cheaper wine from Australia and the UK? Um. I, um, really good question, and, and uh, from Senator, Senator, and how much I enjoyed your, can I say how much I enjoyed your presentation last time? Um, I think that uh, 
the issue, the, the first part of the question, the biggest issue is going to be over agriculture. Um, we have to play fair on this. Um, we, um, we must give greater access, much greater access um, to your farmers and growers. But at the same time, we do have um, the issue that we don't want to see British farming disappear. Now, it's, it should be less controversial than it is in the deal with America, where frankly, agriculture is, is one of the two main factors that, that is holding that agreement up and is going to make, I think, a free trade agreement with America that means something really quite difficult. Um, because you don't have um, the same kind of issues around your uh, meat production, particularly, uh, that, that the Americans do. Um, but I think the answer to your first part of the question is agriculture is where there's going to have to be the most work done to provide something that's, that, that, that's really meaningful. Um, I, um, I'm not an expert on your tariff system, but in exchange for agricultural loosening, uh, uh, manufactured products, I hope that we, we will be selling more of to you. I also um, uh, uh, think that the um, the effect of loosening up movement, I'm, we're both 100% committed to, to Kansa, the, and I think that um, Boris Johnson's recent remarks show that he's strongly on side there. Um, tourism, which is already a very strong um, movement, a lot of the other things that go with uh, the ability of service industries to send people very quickly and easily over to each other's posts and so on. I think we should make um, some further progress on that too. Fantastic, thank you. I, I do have uh, one uh, kind of a question. Someone's very eager to get an answer here. Um, so I'll pose it to you. I don't know uh, if, how um, kind of what background do you have in uh, constitutional monarchy history? But uh, we'll give this a status. So he, uh, he writes, the constitutional monarchy has its benefits. Sorry, the constitutional monarchy has benefits as it upholds Christian values. So do you agree with me that the constitutional monarchy, as Nicholas II made in a parliament too in Russia, was a great system? Um, I'm not really enough of an expert. I mean, I think that, um, well, two points really, first on Russia and then more broadly. Um, the tragedy, the absolute tragedy for Russia, as, um, as for Germany too, was the First World War. Um, I think that those who are expert on Russian history, who I respect, generally say that the Tsars were trying very, very hard to reform and were actually making quite a lot of progress. And they very nearly pulled it off. Um, but the Russian defeat in the First World War, or rather the fact that the Red Army, that the White Army, sorry, was, was all abroad fighting the Germans, um, gave the Bolsheviks the opportunity to um, capture the streets. They only just made it. It was a very close run thing. And, um, and that's where it went. I think the, um, the wider point is that where you have successful con constitutional monarchies around the world, um, you do on the whole have more stable government. Um, I mean, at the risk of annoying Santo, um, who I know I could never annoy because he's such a dear friend. Italy is a very rare example. Mussolini was able to come to power and to uh, wreck the Italian system despite having a king there. But on the whole, those countries that, that had monarchies, which meant something but, but weren't absolute monarchies, um, have done better. And a, and a modern example of that, actually, if you look at the Middle East, um, if you want to Google it, there's a very good speech Malcolm Rifkind, our foreign secretary, made some years ago, saying that if you look right across the Arab world, those Arab countries that have kept constitutional monarchies of one kind or another, um, on the whole, um, have been more stable and less um, uh, 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 likely to breed the worst kind of extremism than republics. Right. Okay. Thank Morocco, you. Morocco is a very good example of that. Compare that to what's happening in most of the rest of North Africa. Very insightful. Thank you. Um. So, uh, 
Another question um, regarding education is, as an educator, COVID has now highlighted the over-dependence of Australian universities on international students. And he asks, I wonder whether it's likewise in the UK and what your views on British universities substituting such students in their intake because of their per person fees are significantly higher. You know, are, are you aware, is there such similar practice in the UK? Um, and you know, yes. do you have views in this shift in military education? It's, this is based? a really, really good question. It's one of the most important questions we face today. And it's a question which I've been putting at various forums and I haven't had a satisfactory answer to. Now, in principle, I support, and I think most of us support, getting overseas students into our universities so they go home they, with, a, with a feeling of a warm feeling towards our country, having acquired our, 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 our hopefully some of our values along the way. It, it's great for networking for our own students. So in principle, I'm strongly behind it. There are two big problems though, one technological and the other one um, political. The uh, uh, technological problem behind us is that we, um, Britain educated in the 1990s, a huge number of nuclear physicists from Iran. Surprise, surprise, we're seeing some of the effects of that now in the Iranian uh, nuclear program. In the last 10 or 15 years, both our countries and the Americans have been educating vast numbers of Chinese students in the kind of things they need to conduct cyber war and to overtake us all in the um, electronics field. So that's the, the... Now, tied in very closely with that is with those students are coming investment funds from nominally, well, they are private companies in China, but companies which are all very close to the Australian state, um, who are, I mean, they're well on their way to taking over Cambridge. I'm proud to say my alma mater, Oxford, has refused Chinese money for investment in, in um, things. So I think there is a really big issue there. To answer your question in a sentence, I think it's got to be addressed. I think that specifically for China, while we should welcome their students, certain kinds of courses they should not be allowed on and certain areas of research they should not be allowed to invest in. But I don't see any sign of that yet. I'm hoping that the inquiry which the government has carried out in the wake of our mistaken decision to allow Hawaii to um, Hawaii to uh, um, uh, 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 participate in our 5G network. They're now revising that and they're looking more widely and I hope that we will start to address that very important issue um, as a result of that inquiry, but, I, but we'll see. Great, okay, well thank you so much once again for another elaborate answer. Um, we're almost out of time, maybe I can squeeze in a, a short one yes, if it, course, it, yeah. uh, with another short answer. So you said um, uh, you spoke of a cultural malaise in Britain do you believe that there will be a renewal now that Britain has regained control of its sovereignty? Yeah, the cultural malaise I spoke of, I think is right across the English speaking world. Um, you, I think, have probably coped with it better than most others, uh, but, uh, but it's certainly affecting America uh, and Canada um, and to some extent all the English speaking countries. Um, I think it does provide that opportunity and I think as Boris recovers from coronavirus and he's only just really started to look fit again in the last day or two, I think we're going to see some really strong leadership again from the government here on this. Fantastic. Well, thank you once again. And uh, Philip, would you like to say a, a few words in close? Um, yes, I, I think we'd all like to thank Sir Julian for such excellent comments uh, and look forward to having you on the program again sometime in the future, but we are tremendously appreciative to you for giving of your time to be with us today. Thank you A privilege. very much. Yes.